to uh, session two. Uh, so, so welcome back. We're, we're, we're going to resume. Uh, and before we do, I just uh, want to acknowledge uh, someone who's joined us, um, and that's uh, John Madigan, who's the former uh, chairman and CEO of uh, Tribune Publishing, uh, former chair of the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, um, and now a uh, director uh, at the McCormick Foundation. Uh, and as someone who worked with John at uh, the Chicago Tribune for many years, uh, was always grateful for his championing uh, free press uh, issues and causes um, around the world, and, and as well as the, uh, the foreign bureaus and foreign correspondents. So John, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks, uh, John. Choice. Thank you. Um, so uh, session two, we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, I, I think, one of the scariest uh, trends in local news, and that is the, the widening of news deserts. Um, uh, across the U.S. Uh, about the diminishment of local news uh, coverage as well. I'll hold this down. Uh, and, and so I, I think this will be a really fascinating discussion. We have fewer presenters in this session, so we'll have a lot of time for a Q&A at the end. So uh, leading this session, we're, we're really blessed uh, to be joined by Penny Abernathy. Uh, Penny is the night chair at the University of North Carolina, and Penny has done cutting edge um, research uh, on news deserts. Um, she's been on CNN, she's quoted uh, literally um, all over the country and all over the world um, on this issue and, and uh, has joined us for this session today. Um, she's also uh, sent copies of her most recent report, which came out last fall, um, and so we'll be grabbing those and I'll make those available to you um, so that you have those. And we also have copies of her book, which we'll also uh, make available to you. So uh, please join me in welcoming Penny Abernathy. Thank you, it's, it's great to be here and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the research that we've done at North Carolina. This has been involved in two fronts. It started out courtesy of a uh, an initial grant that I got from the McCormick Foundation looking uh, very prospectively ahead and imagining that uh, while uh, regional and local and national newspapers were experiencing uh, problems as early as 2008, it was just around the corner for local news operations. So courtesy of that grant, I spent uh, the first couple of years looking at potential solutions for papers in rural areas uh, that were very economically threatened in the South, and then uh, in the second year looking at the problems confronting ethnic newspapers and news organizations here in Chicago. Uh, our pro as I mentioned, our uh, research focuses on two. First is documenting the problem, and I got back into that about five or six years ago because I realized that we did not have the necessary facts to talk about the loss of news organizations, especially locally, uh, which in turn leads to the loss of journalists uh, and then leads to the loss of local news. So I want to briefly go over that research uh, and uh, set up the discussion that's going to follow with an academic colleague and two journalists who are on the front line uh, looking at this. Uh, first, I think it's always important to stop and back up just a minute and talk about why newspapers are uniquely important <coughs> in this country uh, as to, which, uh, and, and as well as to the, to the global enterprise here. So, uh, there's been a lot of research in academia, and fortunately for us, it's understandable that it relates to what journalists do and what uh, the whole business of news is about, especially in the last 50 years. The seminal piece of research came out in the early 70s. Uh, it was done by two professors who were then at uh, UNC who looked at why newspapers were important. And what they concluded was that newspapers had the ability <coughs> to set the agenda for debate of public policy issues. And they had that, that was especially true for local newspapers, because if you think about it, this is a very big country. Uh, and regional television often did not cover those issues, right? So newspapers, local newspapers, were the most credible and comprehensive source of news and information people cared about that started at the local level. Uh, they like to say that newspapers and local newspapers were problem solvers. So that gets back to what Amy said earlier, 
that you're not just looking for problems, you're looking for solutions. So how do they provide that? They provided it both in the stories they covered, the way they played the stories, and the editorials they wrote, the follow-up that painted the difference uh, forward. That's why we should be concerned at the loss of editorial writers, which, because there's been a huge decrease in the number of editorial writers. Uh, the second thing they did is they encouraged regional economic growth and development. They did that, as uh, Tim pointed out, by keeping down the cost of borrowing and doing business for government, as the, the uh, University of Illinois Notre Dame study pointed out. But more importantly, they did it through their advertising, by putting together local residents with local businesses. I was really struck by Amy's notion of the fact that people care about prices, and yet prices is some of the hardest stuff to get information about. When I was doing uh, surveys of this back in the 80s, people invariably talked about how important the advertising was to the local newspaper. That, that when they read the newspaper, they, they put a value on the, the advertising in the same equal way they did to the journalism, because it told them where to get good buys, how to stretch their budget, what to do on the weekend. So we need to think about the loss of print advertising and the loss of digital advertising for local newspapers also threatening the ability of newspapers to relate and provide the information that uh, our, our readers, our, our viewers need. And then the last thing they did is they fostered a sense of social cohesion and identity. And what we've seen from recent research is but when people's social identity goes down, their political participation goes down. There's been a lot of research to show that's especially true in off-year elections because you rely on the local newspaper to cover not only your local races, but for instance, in my state, there are tons of people running for state office that I have no uh, knowledge of how to judge them, and I've depended on the local newspapers to judge them, whether it's the agricultural secretary or the controller for the state or the judges that we elect. By the same token, there's, there's a loss of the, at the uh, congressional level. I was struck by your notion of how many do not even have, uh, half of all states do not even have uh, someone covering congressional. I live in the North Carolina 9th Congressional District. For those of you who are outside the uh, North Carolina, that means I do not have a congressional representative right now because uh, of the election fraud that was uncovered in the past would have most likely been uncovered by four or five regional newspapers and local newspapers. Unfortunately, because of the cutbacks in staff, it was uncovered by a Catawba political science professor who happened to look at the election results two, two, two weeks after the fact and discovered great discrepancy in what was going on on the, uh, on the ballot. So uh, loss, of, loss of news outlets, loss of journalists, and loss of um, uh, and loss of journalism. First, let's talk about the study. I would encourage you, in addition, we've done a, an interactive uh, website where you can drill down to the county level in the U.S. Uh, in all 50 states, we've got 260 interactive maps. We're about to add some more. I'm not sure what I was thinking when I thought this would be a great idea. <laughs> but, uh, but we're still adding to the, to the, uh, to the uh, report and to, uh, we're updating this for 2019. Uh, over the last decade and a half in the U.S., we have lost 1,800 papers. Now, what's important about that, 1,750 are what we would call non-dailies or weekly. So in the past, we've been losing papers in the U.S. over the past uh, 50 years, but mostly it's been the second paper and it's all in a, in a region. So what that means is that uh, we now have 300 counties without any newspaper whatsoever, and we have another 15, almost 1,500 counties with only one local newspaper uh, going forward. Okay. Uh, now, where you live matters. Uh, you can see where most of the papers have been lost. It's been in the, it's been in the south. It's been rural area in the south. And you can also look at the demographic profile of where news deserts are most likely to occur. Uh, the average poverty rate in a news desert is 18%, well as in the U.S. it's running somewhere around only 13%. So news deserts or the or new people, uh, communities at risk of becoming news deserts are much poorer, less educated, and uh, much more, it tend to be um, much less, uh, uh, come from uh, uh, much less well informed. There's been a lot of uh, study that's been good out of Stanford uh, by Jay Hamilton there who has looked at 
the information needs and the lack of access to information in both print or digital forms in those areas. Now, here's another uh, interesting thing. Thanks to uh, Chris's uh, organization, Lion, we've been able to begin to overlay where the digital outlets are in the U.S. This time in 2019, we're going to be adding public broadcasting to that, ethnic media to that, and we're also adding the SRDS, our circulation data, for the 150 major newspapers to show just how extensive the, the loss of uh, uh, coverage has been in these communities. Uh, but the real issue is we've had 525 digital outlets that have risen up. 90% uh, are in mid-metro areas where there are already other digital uh, uh, media outlets, and most of them, 95% tend to be in more affluent areas. And that's important, whether you're a nonprofit or you're a for-profit, you need to find the funding uh, to support you going forward. Okay, so where you live matters, who owns you matters. Uh, just as in Europe, we've gone through a immense period of consolidation. The top 25 uh, companies in the U.S. Uh, own uh, more than almost three quarters of all dailies. They own a significant portion of uh, the weeklies. We've also been through a tremendous period of uh, selling and, and buying, right? Between uh, 2004 and 2014, half of all newspapers changed hands at least once, and half of them changed two times or more. Uh, uh, this, this constant flipping arose uh, the attachment to community. It arose the ability of journalists and editors to set a strategic course. Uh, it also has another uh, uh, problem. It sort of arose the, the ability to come out with a business strategy that works. You tend to have a, a revolving door of, of not only personnel, but of of you people coming in and deciding, I have a great new idea, and this is the one I'm going to uh, follow. The other disturbing part about this is somewhere around the year 2010, we had the rise of a different kind of media bearing. We had hedge funds and private equity funds, which had in the past been passive investors in newspaper companies. In other words, they bought the stock of publicly traded newspaper companies, decided they could manage this a lot better than the traditional newspaper people could do. So they swooped in as a group of uh, chains were going through bankruptcy, started acquiring distressed properties, and their solution was the same ones they used for widget factories, right? We're going to streamline the process, we're going to cut assets. Uh, and uh, here's the other problem. In the past, if you wanted to buy a newspaper in the U.S. in a local market, you typically pay 13 times earnings. So think about that for a moment. If you pay 13 times earnings, that means you're probably going to be committed to a newspaper for at least 14 years in order to sell it and make a profit. But if they only had to pay between two and five times earnings, which means you could come in, slash prices, and then decide what you wanted to do. You could flip it, you could harvest it, or in the end, if you only pay two times earnings and it's just not turning a profit in two to three years, you shut it down. You consolidate it with something else, and that's the way it goes to the newspaper. We're in the process also of updating our database. It will probably be out, our new report will probably be out in the fall again. What we have found is, if anything, the, the, the uh, uh, process of closing newspapers is, is accelerating. Uh, we have picked up 200 news, more than 200 newspapers, maybe more than 200 newspapers uh, that we did not pick up in 2018 uh, that have closed, and 85 of those have closed in the past uh, few months. Most of those closures have come as the big giants, like a gatehouse, looks at marriage version with yet another giant like Manette. For instance, a couple of weeks ago, they shut down the 73 or so, they decided to merge the 73 or, or so papers in the Boston area into 17 that were covering the suburbs of Boston. So there's a lot of uh, merger continuing and consolidation, and of course what happens when you shut down 50 to 70 news organizations, there are a lot more journalists that are thrown out. So what we've had right, is what we addressed in this issue called the rise of ghost newspaper. A ghost newspaper is something that has been so slashed and so diminished in its mission that it is a newspaper still in name only. Uh, and we measure that in, in a couple of ways. One has to do with uh, the, the fall in, in circulation. Um, 
we do not have a measure of a digital, a, a unified way to measure digital, uh, but there's been a significant drop in, in circulation in the last uh, decade, and I'll show you one example in just a minute. <coughs> and, there, and also, if you use the ASNE audit done in 2008 and compare it with the audit, the, the other estimates that have been done recently, uh, newsroom journals have dropped from 52,000 to 24,000 at the moment. Uh, you got uh, television news uh, operations passed uh, newspaper news operations in 2017, not because they had increased staffing, but because the, the fall of um, employment in newspapers was going so quickly. Uh, here's one classic example of the Wichita Eagle Beacon, where I worked in the early 80s. Um, you see in the red, the, the Eagle covered, uh, it's the largest newspaper in Kansas. It covered uh, 79 counties. In, uh, and had a newsroom staffing of, uh, in the late 90s of 190. Today it covers the 10 counties right around the area. Uh, its uh, circulation is below uh, 30,000 and its newsroom is below 25,000. And it does not even have an editorial writer uh, anymore to, to, to lobby on behalf of that. Um, the FCC did us all a good uh, deed back in the early uh, part of this decade. Uh, which has fueled some of Matt's research and my own, uh, they came out with a list of eight critical information needs that if you lived in any community, you needed to be used and informed uh, you on this. Uh, the, uh, they included, you can see the list up there, Matt will talk about it in much more uh, in depth when he comes through, but I encourage anybody uh, who looks at our, our site and says, well, do I have a ghost newspaper? First off, go to your own, do, a, do your own seven weekday survey of dailies. Do your own of the, a month of the, the local newspapers. See how many uh, articles address any of these, these uh, critical information needs in any kind of, of way. Matt and I, are, and I are also two of the four, at, at two of the four academic institutions that received a data dump from, Mar from May, from February, from Facebook. Um, and we're in the process of analyzing that. I, I was struck again by Amy's notion that people rated weather, traffic, uh, and uh, sports and crime as the top things that they cared about on a daily basis. Lots of uh, content analysis of newscasts have found those to be 90% of any broadcasts. Uh, and we're also finding, I'm finding of the initial analysis we've done in North Carolina, it also uh, constitutes 70, 70 to 90 percent of the content that folks run on, on uh, Facebook's Today in uh, Feature. So um, one of the other things to think about with a ghost newspaper is if you look at a, uh, a newspaper like the Charlotte Observer in the late 90s, they had four people alone that covered education, everything from K-12 to the, the higher ed, to the state level policy issue to someone who just looked at the whole uh, shebang. They do not have anybody covering education right now, right from all that. So one of the things to think about when we talk about social cohesion, uh, metro and regional papers have played a very strong role in binding regions together. So if you look at it, a good local paper shows you how the national stories you're reading about are relevant to you. A good regional paper shows you how you're related to someone in your county, in, not in your county, but maybe four or five counties over, right? So it could be the opioid crisis, it could be any range of things. For example, the News and Observer won the Pulitzer Public Service Award, uh, the News Observer based in Raleigh, for writing on the environmental problems of hog farms in eastern North Carolina. So kind of putting it in perspective, all of that in, in leading to uh, uh, a moratorium on hot farms like Kevin's since we've had two devastating hurricanes that would have really destroyed the environment in that whole region. Uh, as I said, you, you can go to uh, usnewsdeserts.com. We try to keep it simple. Uh, and uh, drill down to the county level. We have both state stats. This is North Carolina. Uh, and we have four or five different maps. And we have six up there. Uh, I wanted to talk just briefly before I hand it over to Matt. I, as I said, courtesy of the McCormick Foundation, I've done a lot of work with very small newspapers uh, in the, the 50,000 and less 
arranged, but I, having worked at the Wall Street Journal New York Times, I would say that what we're finding is not that different from what you would find at the national level. One, the successful news of papers, that they are out there, they tend to be independent, not, not corporately owned. What they tie their business strategy model to, their, to the needs and expectations of both the residents and the businesses in their community. And I say ex, uh, needs because often needs are not expressed as expectations in the new survey. They invest in their human capital, and for me, the two human capital that make the most difference are your journalism and your marketing and sales abilities. And then finally, they commit to a five-year plan. They do that in part because of what we've learned in other industries, that there's a constant turnover from all of that. Having said all that, I'm still, uh, I think we need to, there's not going to be one business model, there's going to be many, and we need to think about that broadly for both the whole profit angle. But I remain very concerned that we do not have yet an emerging business model for economically struggling communities. So uh, all the good stuff on subscribers is not going to pay for people who are living at poverty level, uh, that are the dominant ones there. So we need to really think about what else is needed in the U.S., maybe in terms of public or uh, nonprofit funding. And then we need to uh, encourage renewed emphasis on media literacy. I'm going to end with this quote, that best journalism informs the public on matters of public uh, civic concern and turn it over now to Matt, who is going to talk about his research, looking at uh, very specifically, um, we can talk about pricing models as well as uh, some of the content analysis he's been involved with with Duke and is currently looking at uh, in various ways on what sort of news gets actually played for uh, in various news organizations. you down interesting paths. Um, I'm going to talk today about local news and about some of the work that Penny hinted at, um, mapping local news deserts. So the work I'm talking about today um, primarily comes from research that I've been doing um, in uh, collaboration with Phil Napoli at Duke University. Phil and I both used to be at Rutgers University. We had offices opposite each other, and this project came out of that initial brainstorm and collaboration. Um, before I delve into that, I do a lot of research more broadly looking at the evolution of local news ecosystems. Local news mapping is one component of that work. Um, Penny hinted at another one where we are currently looking at Facebook's role in local news and using a data dump that they've provided us with to map nationally the way that social media is stepping into this puzzle of local news distribution. Uh, and also doing some work looking at the role of local news and policy making. Uh, Ted's talk actually sparked a reminder in my mind of a study that we have coming out in about a month with the News Media Alliance, which is looking at consumers' willingness to pay for news media. So before I delve into local news, I will share one little nugget. We looked at how much consumers were willing to pay on a yearly basis for news media, and we found that on average, consumers had a indicated willingness to pay of about $700 per year. 80 to 85% of that budget is dedicated and reserved for entertainment media. So unfortunately, like a lot of what we're going to be saying in this presentation is unfortunately, unfortunately a very small portion of that budget is allocated or available to be captured by news media at least at present. Uh, so with that, I want to delve more specifically into talking to lo about local news and the current local news environment when we look at the content that's being published across this country. Uh, this work is research that we began back in 2017 and began this with the idea that we needed to better understand the type of content that's being produced by local news publishers at scale. And really wanting to understand as we look across the United States, what is the actual content that consumers are receiving? And we began this work um, in the summer of 2017, and shortly thereafter, 
also started to see some rumblings of the FCC loosening of rules on local news ownership. And over time, we've developed a really rich data set here that allows us to track not only what is being distributed, but how some of these policy changes and changes within particular states and particular cities are impacting local news coverage. Uh, we know that local news is important, and I know we're beating a dead horse at this point, but we know local news is important, and we know from prior research that it really has an impact on community engagement and community participation. Um, we have from Pew Research, quote going back to 2016, which those who um, say they always vote in local elections display, display strikingly stronger local news habits than those who do not regularly um, consume local news. We also see that this um, impact is much more notable when we look at minority audiences engaging with local news. But that's an even stronger driver and has a much stronger impact than audiences at large. So there's an even stronger minority impact here. Uh, we also see a lot about the broad crisis of local news. And, and I'll pose a question here that maybe we can come back to later on. As we start to talk about local news in crisis, you hear Penny's work, you hear my work. One of the questions that we've been grappling with in our research and we don't have an answer for right now is how do you define local? We keep saying local news is in crisis. Well, I, I push back and ask everyone to try to think about what does it mean to be local? What is local news? And we don't have a good answer on that. We've been looking for a good answer on that. We've come up with our own definitions, but please chime in on that later on. Uh, so our answer was to go out and begin a process of mapping local news content across the United States. Uh, we looked at available data sets, we looked at available information that was out there, we looked at sources like LexisNexis and the local news content that they were archiving and found that in general it was relatively spotty and relatively sparse when you tried to create a national sample. And so our approach to that was to create our own national sample. What we did back in 2017 is we started by looking at U.S. census communities between 20,000 and 300,000 in the population, trying to get the median small size community. That gives us, based on census data, 1,910 communities. From there, we drew a random sample of 100 communities. Why 100? Well, it's a nice round number. Also, fit within the budget of funding that we have from Democracy Health, which is the number of our funders for this research, often as academics capped by what we can afford. Uh, so, we took this 100 community sample and went through and manually for each community analyzed the local news that was available within that community. We looked at newspapers, we looked at television stations, we looked at radio stations, and then we looked at online only news sources. That generated for us a list of 663 local news outlets that we included in our data sample. We did make one very particular cut here. We said that if we were going to include a community, it had to be within the bounds of that community. So I'll give you an example of the Minnetonka in Minnesota. If the outlet is outside this the city limits of Minnetonka. They had an address that was not of Minnetonka. We did not include it. And again, that goes back to this point of trying to make a definition about local. We're working at scale here, so we have to make hard cuts with regards to what we included as local. We partnered in this project with the Internet Archives. Um, the Internet Archives is a nonprofit organization that works to preserve and um, store online digital content. Their website is archive.org. It is down, or was down, <laughs> this is about 15 years ago. So, no, no, no. But if you're not familiar with the Internet Archive, it is a fantastic repository of websites in general. Um, if you're interested in music, they have rich music repositories. Anyone here a deadhead? They have the largest, I kid you not, they have the largest repository of archive grateful dead music in the world. Fascinating, fascinating organization to go play around with. We partnered with them to create an archive of local news. When we started in 2017, we initially collected a constructed week where we took Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday from seven weeks across a three month period to build an aggregate week. Um, being the kind nonprofit organization that they are, they decided to continue crawling and archiving our, our data set. And we now have two years worth of data tracking local news organizations, 8.1 terabytes of data, 53 million web pages that are archived into the data set all of which we have made publicly available. Uh, I don't have the URL up here because it's kind of wonky, but I will tweet it out with the hashtag if you are interested. You can actually go back and you can download all of the raw data that I'll reference when I talk about our findings. Uh, you can also go into the archive and you can look at specific web pages. So one thing I love about working with the Internet Archive and their 
community partnerships program is that from a researcher perspective, I'm able to take something like this and use this in the classroom and to work with graduate students to teach them about how to work with these types of data sets because they're able to see it visually but also see the data side. Now, in addition to just collecting the web pages, we brought in a number of different data sets to help us to better understand what we were seeing within these communities. Um, first, we conducted a content analysis of the front web pages, and we only did this for that first initial swath of data, that constructed week sample. We manually coded 16,720 news articles, and we coded them to look at whether or not the story was original whether it was local, whether it was covering in that community's boundaries, and whether or not it served critical information needs. And again, those critical information needs that Penny mentioned, emergencies, health, education, transportation, uh, environment planning, economic development, um, civic information, and political life. Uh, in addition to that manual coding, we looked at corporate ownership, we looked at whether or not these entities have social media presence, we drew from the census to look at household income, density per square mile, distance from the large metropolitan market, presence of a university, county seat, state capital, and then also brought in community level demographics, percent white, African American, and Hispanic Latino. So building up a more robust data set so we can look at some of these socioeconomic factors. Now, just to give you an initial highlight here of what we're finding in the data, uh, what we did is we looked community by community. So the end here is 100, but we looked at all 16,000 stories. We aggregated an average by community in order to try to slough off some of the bias that we have from communities that have more stories than others. So that's why you see the end here. What we see is that of the stories that we coded, 43% were original, 17% were local, 56% in some way were stories that covered critical information needs. And those other 44% fell into the category of weather, obituaries, information that didn't fall under what the FCC defines as a critical information need. Now when we start pairing these and aggregating them, we find that 16% were both original and local, but 26% original in serving a clearly identified critical information need, 12% local, and serving a critical information need. And then the sweet spot, only 11% are local, original, and serving a particular critical information need. Now of those critical information needs, 57% uh, fall into either emergencies or political life, 37% were political life, 20% um, were emergencies. The other large category was economic development. Pretty much every other critical information need was a uh, single digit category. Now, beyond this, we've also done a bit of regression analysis, trying to build in some of these variables to look at what really matters significantly. And we, we find some different effects when we start to model this out. If we look, for instance, at the um, number of stories that are produced, we find that the key variables are um, population, size of the community, presence of a university, which is something that pops up again and again, having a university nearby. Um, as well as distance from the largest large metropolitan market. We actually find that more stories are produced locally the further away you are from the large metropolitan market. Now, when we look at whether or not a story is original, a university, again, has a significant effect on that. Percent Hispanic or Latino has a negative effect. Percent African American had a negative effect, but it wasn't significant. Hispanic Latino was significant in driving down the originality of stories. When we look at local, the only factor that was significant and negative was again that Hispanic Latino uh, community presence, that population, again driving down local coverage. Uh, and then with regards to serving critical information needs, we find again that the presence of the university, that presence of the university paper drives up the likelihood that you're going to have critical information needs served. We also find that the further you are from the large metropolitan market, the more likely you are to have critical information needs served. Last thing we looked at here was um, newspaper ownership, at least in these models, and we find that uh, when you have a conglomerate, a large organization owning multiple chains, you tend to find less local content, but more original content. So, more or less have summarized all of this, but generally seeing that we're only seeing a small percentage of, of stories being local to a community, 
Um, less than half the stories are provided to a community by local media outlets that are original, and just over half of the news stories provided to a community by local media outlets actually address what we would identify as a critical information need. Um, I pointed to distance to a large metropolitan market, a number of universities having a significant effect here, and that minority population driving down the quality of that local news coverage. Uh, we're doing some other things with this, and I'll just really quickly highlight a few of the things that we're starting to drill into with these data as we move forward. We are starting to use machine learning techniques to automatically code the data now that we have that initial read done. And so we are starting to look longitudinally at the two-year sample that we now have across two years on August 6th. Uh, we're also doing data mapping, looking at the networks and flow of media. Um, the different websites that are mentioned here, we're looking at the presence of sources like YouTube, Google, Facebook, and Instagram is a part of why we're really excited to have the Facebook data. We are just in the depths of that, so I don't have findings from that yet. Um, but we are looking particularly within those data at the networks that are created by corporate ownership and corporate entities on this that network of papers and the co-linking that occurs and the way in which those networks form together in the tight -knit clusters and we're seeing a strong effect there um, from corporate media ownership. Uh, and then, inspired by Penny, we are starting to do some mapping, where we are mapping out how local coverage is and automatically analyzing the places that are named within stories that we have in our data sets. The larger a circle here for a given community, the less local the content is, the smaller the circle, the more tight knit, the more local that content is. And so, we are going to be making these available by the end of the year via the web, uh, so that people are able to drill down into the data that we have been publishing. I had a few success stories that we could point to. Unfortunately, Jen from the book club is not here yet, but I coincidentally had her organization in here as one that we've seen successfully at very local level influencing the flow of local news. Uh, I did not put that in there knowing that I was coming here. It's been in there for a while. Uh, so we do see some local examples that are driving success. A lot of these are community funded, and we see them really getting down into the nitty gritty of producing original local content in a meaningful way. And so with that, I'll leave you with my contact information, uh, names of my colleagues on here who have driven this work. This is something that's been produced by a team, uh, not produced just for me. I'm incredibly grateful for them for their support and for the support of our funders. Thank you for your time. Address you know, in terms of 
human population are and also half of the GDP. And uh, uh, if you add up everything about Nigeria, um, you have to come to a conclusion that in spite of, I mean, with regards to its potentials and its capacity, it's with the possible exception of, I think, South Africa, uh, no doubt Egypt, uh, it is one great country that can do great things. And if it's doing it badly, it can also do things very badly for, for, for the region. So my own point here is that that's why we have to be very concerned about Nigeria. So the summary of Nigeria's story in one regard is how this country with its enormous wealth uh, came to the point that this year it got elected into what's called the world <laughs> to become the world uh, capital, the uh, poverty capital, uh, with uh, 44% of its people now in extreme poverty, and six people dropping into that uh, poverty uh, mix every uh, minute. So, um, for everything that most people know, uh, this is how media has worked in Nigeria. Nigeria's independence was almost underwritten by the media. In 1859, we had the first newspaper, um, which led the whole struggle for independence. So it's really the popular imagination of Nigerians what the newspapers can do. Um, uh, we had the unfortunate experience of this crazy 30 years of military dictatorship, which totally destroyed the country. Um, and I think it's probably responsible for the worst thing that has happened in that country. But the media, particularly newspapers, we are also at the forefront in fighting, making a case for return to democracy and defending human rights. And that's the point. And now in the era of democracy, <coughs> helping to really insist on Republican values, uh, human rights, and newspapers have also been uh, at the very forefront. Uh, some of you will also be familiar with the story, most recent story in Nigeria of an insurgency. We entered this year, we entered into the second decade of the insurgency in Nigeria, which has gained far more uh, lives than we ever had in a civil war. So when we fought a civil war in Nigeria, it lasted for only about two and a half years. Now we have uh, 10 years going into an insurgency very huge human cost. Um, so the media is really very important in the discussion of Nigeria and uh, the progress of uh, what is possible. This is how to historicize media in Nigeria, 1859, as I said, first newspaper, and then followed by radio, uh, television, radio, and the internet, um, which is very recent, 1996. Um, uh, this is how it breaks down. I happen to work for this newspaper, and I think it's interesting that the guy who founded the newspaper was, he had worked in the US and won the Pulitzer Prize, also a graduate of Medill. So he came back and set up a paper, wanted to do a great newspaper in Nigeria, and uh, it could only last for uh, two and a half years. Again, a very difficult uh, environment to work. Um, so I speak about the liberal traditions in our media, and I think it's all codified. So it's not flippant, it's something that's really well uh, uh, engraved. It's a treaty, that all the treaties that Nigeria has signed to, and it's uh, all well known. Section 22 of our Constitution from makes it very robust. The only institution in our country that has given the mandate and remit uh, for accountability to hold the political uh, the, uh, governance accountable. And of course, copious case law also have to reinforce this. This is just all of this earlier. Now, if you look at what this section of our Constitution and this will say, then you have to understand that that, in a way, is given the media a very, very strong role. Um, and we'll see how. So, 
But unfortunately, you know, this is a story, not it's peculiar to Nigeria. I think this is something that um, everybody's been talking about it is uh, today. So um, when I started about 30 years ago, uh, working in the media, I worked in a local newspaper, truly local in that sense, um, when something's not national, because <laughs> it's local. But this is a state, and the state, you know, it's in the middle belt of Nigeria, has about 2.4 million people. Um, the newspaper was printing about 400,000 copies a day. Um, the great newspaper we all lose, everybody will hope that you will walk in that newspaper office in Lagos, because printing every Sunday, one million copies a day. And on the weekend, and that's for weekends, and during the week, it will print between 700 and so on. Now the story, and yeah, that these two newspapers have disappeared. But in disappearing also, a whole lot of, you know, all the other little, little players have disappeared. Why, why is this? Uh, a whole lot of reasons have been given. 30 years of uh, terrible military dictatorship, put so many great talents in the media in flights, they went to do other great things outside the country in exile. I was myself out of political exile for 10 years. Uh, many journalists returning to jail. So that's really killed the media in the sense. But also recently, uh, harsh economic conditions, and then digital migration has really complicated uh, uh, this, this state of the media in the country. Um, in spite of all that, so some years ago, we again asked ourselves the question, how are we going to get out of this mess? That's how, that's the history of my own newspaper. So we set up a newspaper called Freedom Path, and we said, okay, we really want to do serious investigative kind of reporting. And I would say that seven years down the line, uh, it's paid off in the sense that if you want to do, in spite of the difficulty of the terrain, serious newspapering, serious journalism, and this is directed in those core values of the factual, making sure that everything is verifiable, and uh, that you know that you can define independence of all its ramifications, and it's paid off, I think. Uh, so we are the third most read newspaper in the country today. The page views that we are doing is uh, 9 million per month. We have 1.2 uh, Facebook uh, readership. We have a newsletter, which is 900,000. Uh, so in a sense, you know, that's telling us that Nigerians are yearning for this kind of stuff. But the truth about the Nigerian story today is that the big technology companies mostly um, and this is not saying that in the other So today, the true newsroom in Nigeria <coughs> is Facebook, because 23 million Nigerians, they are accessing their news sites, um, Facebook and Twitter. So, and then with, of course, content and all the promise that, you know, I also give you revenue, everybody is also publishing on this platform, but the revenues have not come. So it's a really big challenge, you know, for to do uh, media and this Now, so 2016, we said, okay, let's try to do something interesting. So we set up. Oh, I should say very quickly that although we're a newspaper, we also have a not-for-profit arm, which is essentially and the gentleman who is seated there. Uh, so the non for profit um, is really a journalism innovation and development platform. Um, so Dubao, for instance, uh, is the biggest fact-checking site in the country today. And uh, EMA, that is what we call an attempt at doing accountability media. Um, I give the addresses at the end of the slide, so if you're interested. Um, what's interesting about this too uh, is that we wanted to use this to test how we could do accountability media seriously in 
Uh, and so Udama is really data and technology. But if you're familiar with Nigeria, you know, politically, you find out that last year, uh, the finance minister in the country was fired on account of the work that uh, Udeme was doing. Till today, we have been able to bring the National Assembly, which is our parliament, that never opens its budgets to scrutiny, although it was holding the executive accountable, but it will never reveal its own budgets. But it does been very, very hard and strong reporting on these institutions. We've been, we've been able to open it up. But I think the greatest success that we've recorded, perhaps, in trying to really do accountability media, this is still at the national level, bear in mind, uh, is the biggest, Nigeria is just a country full of scandals, you would say, but the biggest scandal to date is the procurement of military equipment, which were fighting a war, the soldiers ended up stealing 2.1 billion you know, uh, people who are managing the war efforts. And nobody could, but this was something that you know, a newspaper uh, was able to do. I mean, in aggregate, based on this whole work that we were able to do, so we became part of the uh, group that worked around the Panama Papers in Nigeria. And if you go just look at the Panama Papers again, um, Nigeria had the most starts in doing <laughs> in the Panama Papers, yet Nigeria was, is still the only place that nothing has happened to anybody here. You know in terms of bringing people to accountability. So just to let you know the very difficult environment in which you yeah. have. So, but um, the idea is what we do from here. So we said we need to take what we've been doing at the national level now to the sub-national level. Um, something has happened into budgeting in Nigeria this year. Uh, up to this point, the federal government has a way of allocating what it, the money it gets from oil so to share it out to states, and then states will take the, uh, the <coughs> ration of the local governments, often they then keep it, and then they never give it to local governments. So we have something like a little um, revolution in that regards now that local governments now have an autonomy, but that's also going to be a big problem. So the point of corruption is probably just going to move from point A to point B, reinforcing the need now to do accountability media at grassroots levels. So this just helps to give uh, the footprint of what we call community media, a whole lot of what is community media in Nigeria truly uh, will be community radio but the news were framed, uh, decimated first by the economic crisis that we're going through, uh, literacy rate, uh, and just the preference for radio for people who are outside the urban period. So community radio really has made some little progress uh, in the country. Uh, so, uh, this is the assumption we are making that if you will do something national, you then have to think through these three processes across how do you produce journalism, how do you distribute that journalism, and then how do you find that journalism. Um, so, um, no doubt, the thought, the sea level will be the most difficult point that most people are grappling with. And uh, I would also want to share with you um, how we think that we are looking at the, this point. Uh, first of course, <laughs> you, you then have to look at what business model, the business model that sustained journalism up to this point, of course, basically has uh, uh, collapsed. So I have to think of new innovation pathways in that regard. Um, and we are currently exploring uh, 
uh, how to do membership, um, and which will be, I think, will be uh, introducing, we're working on the assumption that if we have now about 900,000 people subscribing to our newsletters, what we each make if we just target our diaspora communities, Nigerian diaspora across the probably the smartest uh, today, and they, they, they contribute the second contributors to what we call internal generated revenue, about 20 billion. So we're hoping that if we can provide good content that will service this community, they will also be able to support uh, doing some interesting journalism. Um, this is uh, how the so previous guest sense of the summary. This is how to reach out to some of the, the PTC I did the talk is the, uh, the innovation center. And I invite you to please uh, try to uh, visit. The Google is um, the fact checking platform and he then uh, is uh, our accountability platform. Thank you very much, appreciate it. story and watch my parceling numbers go insane. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people care about substantive topics there. Yeah. And in the, I came there in 2014. When I left, the staff had been cut by 60% in those five years. And so, already probably had cuts before. So. Yeah, I'm guessing that it's probably down about 80% from 2008, from when you talked about, you know, just based on what I've heard from before then. So, you know, it's, it's definitely, today, you know, when we were discussing ghost newspapers, you know, that is a really real concern. You know, it is not a news desert, but when you're down to um, the SJR, this is a city of about 120,000 people with all the institutions I just described. The SJR now has 15 full-time journalists. And, you know, also when you start factoring in that this is a seven-day-a-week enterprise, and not necessarily everything happens between nine to five. People take vacations, people get sick. That's why I refer to MacGyvering it. And you know, sadly, I'm also president of the, I'm national president of the Associated Press Media Editors, which is a professional group for editors around the country. So you know, I talk to a lot of people, not just in my own chain, but um, it's an issue all over. And what scares me is the level of burnout and issues I see among editors, you know, just in terms of people really contemplating whether they want to stay and keep doing this. How, how hard is it to recruit, and who do you tend to recruit, and how many of how many long-standing journalists do you have left in the, the newsroom? Uh, yeah. One of the one of the complaints I hear 
from editors or lamentations is we've lost a lot of history, which again, um, uh, Amy's survey showed that people value having reporters who know the history of the community. Yeah, you know, unfortunately recruiting is something I haven't had much of a chance to do in the last year or so because it seemed like every time someone left, uh, we just, you know, the city of Springfield reporter left and I was told, figure out how to absorb it, you know, I'll shift somebody around. So, you know, it was a lot of making decisions about what you weren't going to do. And what I also worry about is the type of journalism that gets done. Because when your staff shrinks, it becomes harder and harder to pull someone to say, you will do a major in-depth story. Because, you know, if you're losing that person for a week, well, then who picks up the slack on other things happening? You know, um, and this is not, you know, it was not just an issue in Springfield. As far as recruiting, it also became harder and harder because a lot of times, you know, if someone left and you did get to fill the position, you know, you'd be told to fill it for a lower salary. Uh, next, Matt, I'd like to probe a little bit more. You said you've been doing stuff on policy. Um, it, it's, um, I found the uh, work that Amy did at Pew alarming in the lack of, uh, of awareness of where uh, used to the organizations are right now in terms of the problems they face. Uh, there were a set of hearings a couple of weeks ago. The News Media Alliance is pushing for kind of a suspension of uh, antitrust rules to allow the newspapers to get together and negotiate better conditions for Google. Uh, you have uh, Tom Wheeler, the former FCC, saying he's dead set against that. And, uh, he compares what he wants to do as a break open with the break open of the code versus what uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders might be our lobbying for, which is a break, uh, break apart kind of strategy. What, what, where, where do we stand on policy? Where, what's the awareness of the of the, our legislators at any kind of level? Have you found anything? And where, what are you seeing in terms of uh, their awareness? So two answers in response to that question. Um, first, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that part of what sparked our interest in this topic and part of why we wanted to carry on the longitudinal study was looking at increased consolidation and we're not far enough along that I have claims that I could fully stand behind at this point statistically but we do see initial evidence that um, aggregated ownership does lead to a decrease in local coverage and as you've heard from a number of other talks today that decline in local has some ramifications when you think about, for instance, driving subscribers. That local content is increasingly important, so there's a push and pull here of what, what matters, and that's gonna have implications with regards to how we think about federal policy over ownership. Now, secondary to that, I've been doing a lot of work looking at the role that local news plays in shaping policy, and just wrapped up a three-year study with the William T. Grant Foundation looking at the role of local news organizations in policy making. Contextually, that was around childhood obesity. Um, but we looked at 5,000 policy documents, um, federal, federal hearings, um, federal bills that were passed pertaining to childhood obesity, now also looking at the state level and looking at a number of different state legislative bodies. Um, looking at the research that makes its way into policy and looking at the role that news media plays in filtering that research in. And what we find in that is that of the research that makes its way into policy, news media only brokers, the only serves as the intermediary for about 11% of that research evidence. That most of that policy making is occurring through the think tanks, through the foundations, um, through the different advocacy groups that get involved in Capitol Hill, and that increasingly policy makers are shying away from looking to the media as a source of information when it comes to policy making. So troubling just even in the role that media play, but really troubling when we think about media advocating for themselves in terms of policy, in that we see both quantitatively and qualitatively evidence that policymakers are turning away from the media as a policy source. Um, uh, Angie and Dapo, this is both for you. I, uh, I'm um, struck by when you do see policy uh, being contemplated at either the national or the state level, Invariably, it looks at things like antitrust, right? And if you look at uh, where where our research is shown and where Matt's research is shown, 
you're most likely to have these deserts, it is around economically struggling areas. So uh, I would be interested, Angie, in how how regional newspapers in the U.S. should look at that, and I'm interested, Dapo, in how you've looked at a country with a 44 percent poverty rate that makes 18 percent to the in our communities look like we were uh, uh, naturally blessed to compare that. So. Yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge as you know the pressure is there to you know provide what um, readers want, and you know it's kind of a vicious circle. The whole um, you know, as you mentioned, economically disadvantaged communities may not be subscribing, but that doesn't mean that they aren't important to cover. Yeah. But, you know, there's just the increase in pressure. You know, I mean, the reality in our situation is that um, newspapers have always been, like, presumed uh, arguments uh, advocating on behalf of people. Uh, and this is a role that I think we, we, we have to play without uh, anybody electing you to that kind of role. Um, but I think in an analogous sense, um, a policy in Nigeria, and I think one can speak with some confidence also, like in West Africa, um, has been to shy away from kinds of uh, media, the, the, the history of uh, antagonism, what we generally call press government relations, have been just one <coughs> of a, a, a serious foreign and um, government high-handedness over time. So press freedom kinds of issues will be uh, the main, uh, but truly now the major driver has been the economy uh, and things like literacy um, and well, uh, digital. Um, let me just back up. I, I, could you explain in, in uh, 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 four or five sentences what your business model is? So, uh, I, as I understood it, there's a for profit and a non for profit, yeah. and so how, how they kind of uh, interrelate. Okay, because the truth is that stagnation has virtually collapsed completely in Nigeria. Um, and advertising is truly a social atrophy. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, how do you do this? This sends a whole wave of journalism to Nigeria. Uh, some of the biggest newspapers, with possible exception of just five of them, are not being salaries regularly. Um, and they somehow own us. <laughs> But the 13 months of salaries, which really is foiling the whole corruption in the media itself. But for us, what we, we try to do, um, and this is interesting, um, we're happy to hear your thoughts about this. Uh, it, so you have to ask the question how the newspapers that built loyalty on the basis of circulation in the past what the people look into. So you could say rich context. Okay, fine. So um, in the age of digital, what will that mean? Um, I think, you know, uh, positioning yourself in things like building a very strong loyalty around membership is a model that uh, people should think about very strongly when thinking about that. But up to this point, um, we're doing about 33% advertising. We're doing philanthropy, not for profit funding. It's uh, a, a big part of our, uh, we're doing events. Um, interestingly, um, the colleague is here. We're also doing civic technology, um, turning a whole lot of our content into new, into uh, value. So our data is what we see as the future of uh, prosperity as it is. Everything that you produce at the end of the day is data, so why not crunch it and turn it into a new kind of value? So today, we're helping the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation uh, not only track, uh, that's from the non-for-profit uh, uh, part of our work, to track, they put a whole lot of money in Healthcare development in Nigeria, 
so using tools of investigative journalism and data journalism would help them to track what that means. So that pays into our non-for-profit uh, arm, and the non-for-profit itself then gives small grants to other newspapers, including ours. Uh, but the nature of its own non-for-profit status is to shield our editorial independence. Uh, that's just uh, one kind of thing that we also do due diligence. And um, a whole lot of little, uh, little uh, things in that. But I really think that uh, ability to transform our data into new sources of revenue is uh, the, the biggest thing that we can engineer. I want to open this up for questions. While we're doing that, I have a question for Angie and one for Matt. Uh, uh, you know, as a professor, you constantly uh, have uh, students who come up to you and say, why should I go into this business? My parents are telling me there's something <laughs> that uh, is going to be a little more lucrative than being a journalist, right? And a little more stable. Uh, so Matt, why should you do it on the business side? Angie, why should you do it on the journalism side? What, what's the answer that uh, I should give? Students that you would give to students. I think part of the answer that we get is that being in a college of liberal arts, we want our students to have a broad education with the potential to come into uh, journalism or into media management. Um, we try to encourage them to cast a broad net. I'd be perfect evidence of this. You never know where your career is going to lead you, but journalism is a pretty damn good place to start. You know, I am somewhat optimistic that events like this, you know, that we are starting to turn the focus on and letting people know what they might be losing out on before it's too late. Um, you know, I think this is an issue that has kind of crept up on people. And uh, by bringing the awareness, you know, I was optimistic by some of the stats we heard earlier today about how people do value, you know, local news. So for young people, I would say that there is still a, you know, a need for people to do what we do. And then purely selfishly, I mean, gosh, I wanted to be a reporter since I was 12 years old, you know, what kind of great job is it that you get to go out and talk to interesting people and find out things and write about it? You know, it's, it's just, it's a great job and the country needs more people. Great, questions? Yeah. I was interested today that no one has mentioned in the whole morning mobile or smart speakers or reaching readers where they are. So for example, the person who runs the local uh, uh, NPR station last week said to me that people associate it with listening to it in its car, but more than half the people who listen to the NPR station are listening to it in home while they're cooking because they don't their hands aren't free. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sort of wondering, and, and of course that NPR station is actually hiring local reporters. So I, I, I'm wondering how you're thinking about uh, reaching people in new forms with local news. Let me give one stat and then turn it over to Angie Dapo uh, back in the, around 2010, when we were trying to get the uh, newspapers to uh, uh, to change over and, and consider responsive design, what we found in every place we went was that uh, newspapers that that put up a responsive design suddenly 80 percent of their traffic came in through mobile devices, right? Versus the desktop. So there is a huge shift of that. I myself have not subscribed to the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times since 2013 because I like them to experience on mobile much better and frankly I don't have to really recall the text a lot of times too. Uh, so I mean I think part of it is getting people away from, which I think we've moved away from, to the, um, the, the notion that it's coming through a laptop. It is a mobile device and it, it, it is a whole range of things. So, uh, and Matt, Angie, anything you got? Yeah, I mean the data that I was talking about in this study of this more from the production side. On um, the subscription side, in the report that I mentioned coming out from News Media Alliance, we found that about 55% of subscription revenue was driven primarily by a desire to consume via mobile platforms. Uh, so 
clearly that's pressing that I don't think that can be ignored or understated because that is only going to continue to grow. I can only speak to my former corporation. One, one benefit was that there was a centralized tech team, that we didn't have to have a developer on site in our newsroom, that they could provide you know, solutions for us for things like newsletters, you know, Amazon Echo, things like that. The flip side is that a lot of those things were very templated, and you know, like a newsletter that scraped in through RSS. So if you wanted to do a hand curated newsletter, which you know, I would argue is probably more engaging and more appealing with you know, people, you didn't have to develop the tools, but you did have to find someone who would put that together how many daily or weekly or whatever. Um, mobile is huge for us. Um, 13 million Nigerians have uh, internet access to them, and uh, 23 million have uh, smartphones. So it's something you would just ignore to them. It's kind of nice that you don't even have to talk about it now because it's so incorporated in the chat. Thanks. Um, you really got me to think about a number of things, and that it's great to see you. Um, so to the puzzling question that you ask these people, why advise young people to go into journalism? For me, the answer is the same is a question I've got you guys on the whole about your research, which is how are local news media identified and researched in drawing your conclusions? Are niche or fringe or digital outlets, activists, Facebook sites, or Facebook generally as a source for people to get their local news included in how people get their local news? And before you answer the question, just to give you a sense, a quick sense of how large this phenomenon is. I'm just going to rail off, especially for people who aren't from Chicago, in alphabetical order, the publications I'm talking about in Chicago. I'm talking about Austin Talks, Austin Weekly News, Beachwood Reporter, Better Government Association, Black Club Chicago, Capital Facts, Center Square, Chicago Activism, Chicago Crusader, Chicago Daily Observer, Chicago Defender, Chicago Dispatcher, Chicago Indie Media, Chicago Innocent Center, Chicago Jewish News, Chicago West, Chicago Media Action, Chicago Parent, Chicago Reader, Chicago Reporter, Chicago Task Force, City News, Chicago Talks, Cook County Record, Crane Chicago Business, Free Spirit Media, Gate News, Health News Illinois, OI, Hyde Park Herald, Immigrant Connect Chicago, Injustice Watch, Inside Online, Invisible Institute, La Raza, Law Bolton, New City, Next Door, One Illinois, ProPublica Illinois, Progress Illinois, Public Narrative, Red Line Project, Social Justice Nexus, Southside Weekly, Streetwise, Tribe, Univision Chicago, West Side Writing Project, and Windy City Times. That is a lot of local news there. So, yeah, how do you factor that into your research? And the, why do people need to get their local news from mainstream media? And I didn't mention any of the activist Facebook pages at all. Yeah, you know, we capture in our research those organizations if they are in the bounds of the city that we're looking in. So for instance, when we go down into the southern part of the US and we're capturing border cities, we're capturing a lot of activist blogs that are providing local community news and information about key immigration issues. We do have a blind spot in our research and we don't capture social media. And there are a number, large number of these niche media outlets that provide primary content through social media, through Facebook. Um, so that's not captured in our work, but we are capturing a lot of those niche sites and they are critically important, but I can't speak to the audience consumption side, I can only speak to production. Uh, so uh, what we did is uh, start with um, the uh, ENP and the BIA Kelsey of uh, newspapers. Uh, from that, we found that it was about a 33% error rate. The BIA Kelsey's of what they had is, is updated. The ENP is about 20%. So we built ours from the ground up. Uh, uh, in a number of means started uh, merging those two. Then we went back to state press associations to uh, get a list of everybody that was a member of the state press association. We also talked to, found out anything in the state that was a digital site that was not listed as part of the press associations. The problem with press associations is, depending on the press associations on Shopper or a community newsletter, 
can be a newspaper. So what we did in defining a newspaper was making sure they provided some of the, uh, of the content, some. I mean, some could be covering a city council meeting of the critical information needs that were needed. Thanks to Lion, we got the uh, 525 uh, uh, sites that we went through. Uh, we're now adding the ethnic newspapers uh, to that, uh, ver uh, uh, ethnic news outlets, I should say, courtesy of the work that's been done, I think, at Cal State and at uh, CUNY. Uh, and we have got added PBS and um, uh, PBS and NPR to that. We're also differentiating between what's a, a satellite and what is a mother hub. Uh, for actually producing news. So what we're looking at when we're defining it, Jack, is if you are actually a news organization as defined by what the FCC says is a critical information. Yeah. Thank you. So Nancy, you were talking about the critical information needs, and I think on the one hand, it's good news that um, readers are still turning to local newspapers if they want to get information about emergencies and elections and what you were talking about. But is it also a huge problem on the other hand that those are information that might be so crucial to the functioning of society and democracy that they actually should be offered free of charge? So did you, did you have findings about what people are looking for and opposed to what they're um, willing to pay for? Uh, it's an interesting question to speak about, Mike. Um, we in the analysis of content did not look at audience needs or what audiences were reading. Uh, and in fact, in the News Media Alliance study, that really had a different objective, so we weren't able to incorporate critical information needs into that study. But I do think that gets at the important question. A lot of these organizations, however, that we include, and again, in our content analysis, we include TV, online only, newspapers, so it's slightly broader um, and a little bit more loosely defined than what Penny was talking about, but a lot of that content is provided for free. Um, so while a lot of these do have paywalls up, a lot of that front page content is freely available. It would be interesting, however, to go back though, and look at how the, those critical information needs impact willingness to pay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, this is actually following up on both what Candy and Jack asked about and then introduced me to them, which is really radio. And I have a lot of questions about radio. First, you know, NPR has a very different model um, that is reasonably successful, you know, user uh, supported. Uh, it also, um, you know, in, in local NPR affiliates, certainly based on my own observation in different parts of the country, do a pretty good job. Uh, covering communities, I guess just a real, very small sample, but I, I'd like to uh, hear a little bit more on both those points. And then I just want, wonder if there's, when we're looking at this issue, if there's something of an anti-radio bias because um, you know commercial radio and specialized radio also reach, reach very important audiences, whether you define that as, new, as news, maybe that's debatable. And then in a global context, um, Radio is critically important uh, for serving local news needs, and because of its visceral nature, it sort of comes and just vanishes. It's not reported in the same way that print or, or uh, websites or any other kinds of, um, of media is is documented. I wonder if there's a, a something of a of a bias against uh, radio when looking at local news and how. I would say, based on my own experience, I don't think there is. I'm, researchers are always willing to admit there's bias that comes in and everything. Uh, what I will say about NPR, when I published the first report in 2016, NPR was the first to reach out from the very top level to say, how can we cooperate with news outlets to cover these communities that are without uh, uh, news or that are emerging news deserts. The second thing I would say is having talked with a number of people at PBS, they will tell me they like the kind of uh, local government structure that uh, uh, facilitates news coverage in NPR. They find it very difficult to do a regional story that then gets picked up on the national level. So I think there's a lot more flexibility in the way NPR is organized. I think the sad part is, though, that if you look, 8%, only 8% comes in on radio, and if you look at what the FCC did even in 2011, I think only 20% of radio, commercial radio stations had any local news, 
And if it's like the local radio in my hometown, it's a uh, half hour of talking with somebody uh, about a local event. So it's uh, so I still think I do think there's an if you get outside the country I, uh, of the U.S., I think that um, it's uh, it will probably be a very different one for for uh, DAPO than it is. The other thing I will say, I've been on NPR and I've been on PBS. It strikes me that there's a very different audience that listens to both of those too, and they're almost. It's the same way as you look at the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Uh, it's a very different audience that both of those outlets serve. Uh, for the radio. Yeah. I mean, radio in developing countries is the lifeblood, without a doubt. And I think we were saying that uh, during the break, um, as much as newspapers mean something serious for us, uh, they generate the stories. A lot of this is carried over on radio to to amplify and create a debate. And, but I think if you look at literacy value um, and the needs of communities, perhaps agrarian community and things like that, radio is without the you know, uh, major issue. Yeah, we got time for one more. Okay. So I was a part of the design research process last summer for the Local News Initiative and participated in research in Indianapolis. And some of the some of the findings that we found just from qualitative research was that a lot of, at least in Indianapolis, news consumers were consuming news in these um, Facebook groups called ch uh, chatters or community. And I'm curious, and I know this is a little bit of a follow-up uh, to Jack's question, and, and I know there's a, um, a blind spot with social media, but I'm curious just your thoughts on the role of these community groups, whether it's Facebook or Nextdoor, in news deserts, and um, if there are opportunities for newspapers to collaborate. Um, and So again, I said we have a little bit of a blind spot here, but we have done some deep dives building off of the initial 100 community sample. We um, did a deep dive into Cleveland and into Akron, and we ran focus groups um, hand in hand with the data mapping that we've been doing. Um, we also are starting, uh, myself and as Penny mentioned, herself and a few others, to look into the today and future at Facebook. Um, it, it's too early on the record to say anything concrete about specifically what we're seeing here and what effect or what proportion of the conversation can be attributed to these channels, but we, we know they're important. We know that a lot of community news is driven, community discussion is driven through these channels. It's just incredibly difficult without accurate data and accurate records to quantify what proportion of the conversation occurs through those channels. And I think we can all speak to that just in our own lived experiences thinking about how we obtain some of that community information. A lot of that does come through those social media channels. Again, it's really hard to measure and quantify that in a meaningful way that could then be used to guide local community news efforts going forward. Uh, let me give two, uh, two anecdotes to, to this and answer that question. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, several, a uh, couple of years ago, I had a, the local member of the town council come up to me and say, how do you correct a story on Facebook? It turned out that the local newspaper had not sent a reporter to a local uh, town council meeting. She and the mayor got into a heated discussion, and the only account of that was what the mayor posted on his Facebook, which at that point she considered highly inaccurate, not fair, not objective, and at that point had, had been shared all around the entire town. So it speaks to the, the issue of when we've lost the journalist to actually uh, provide transparency as well as some kind of objectivity. The second thing I would say uh, is uh, that one of the things that we need to be aware of, and I want to get back again to what Amy said, I, I started doing research on local news as a, first as a journalist and then as a business executive back in the mid-70s. It came back over and over and over again 
that it, newspa that newspaper readers valued the advertising that they got for the information, and it was often it was about helping them shop better, helping them make better life decisions. We have to really uh, look at what's happened on the engagement side with people who are looking at local news outlets when they've lost, especially newspapers, lost the print advertising. And in most counties and most communities that are small, we found as much as between 75 and 80 percent of the digital advertising is, is going to Google and Facebook. So we've eliminated a whole source of information that, that pushes people over to social networks or to, or to Google. I was going to say, you know, it's, it's a real source of concern, I think, that, you know, networks like Nextdoor or Facebook, people view them as sources of community information or, you know, informally news and aren't making that distinction between things that anyone can just post versus things that have actually been vetted and verified. I can think of a number of times we had to do reporting to debunk something that was sweeping next door or Facebook, and probably my favorite one was the morning I got an angry call from a lady who said, why have you not reported that there is flesh-eating bacteria at Knight's Action Water Park? <laughs> there was not, but it was all over Facebook that someone had been stricken by face flesh-eating bacteria at this very popular local business. So we had a very interesting story about this business frantically trying to save its own reputation on social media and how one person could post something on Facebook that you know, went viral and just simply wasn't true. So, you know, but I worry that media literacy, and I know, you know, Medill's done a lot with that, you know, people are not necessarily making the distinction between a news source and I read it on next door. Yeah. Yes, okay, but well, thanks to the, uh, to the Thanks, Penny, thanks to our panelists. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, so we're gonna break for lunch, uh, and the lunch has been brought in and is right. back uh, back there in the corner. We will uh, reconvene at 1.30 this afternoon, um, so about 53 minutes from now. And uh, the next session is going to be about innovation um, in local news and some of the new um, business models that are emerging in local news and in, in, uh, in local news information. I also wanted to let you know that, that copies of Penny's report and uh, her most recent book are on the back table. So please uh, grab one of those uh, to take with you for your information. And also, if you need a charge, uh, there's a power strip uh, in the back. So if your phone's running low on battery or laptop, uh, you can charge up over lunch uh, back there. So. Uh, uh, Tom, I just want to say, I don't think, it's I don't think there are a ton of books back there, <laughs> as many reports. The reports are back there and up there, but if you don't get a book, if somebody beats you to it, send me an email and I'll, I'll get you a book. <laughs> thank, thank you, Penny. All right, enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs>